Hello and welcome to Close Reading Classic Literature with me, Dr Octavia Cox. Last week I gave a paper at the British Association for Romantic Studies seminar and I thought that I would share that paper here too. Today I'm going to be talking about an essay called On Envy by the romantic literary critic William Hazlitt. He would go on to publish this essay in a volume of essays called The Plain Speaker in 1826. So to give you a very quick uh, outline biography then of William Hazlitt in case you've not heard of him. He was born on the 10th of April 1778 and he died not many years later, only 52 years later, on the 18th of September, 1830. He was a literary critic and an early journalist. So the Romantic period saw a rapid increase in cheaper mass circulation magazines, and that meant that there needed to be more material to fill those magazines. So it was a time when journalism increasingly in Britain became an industry, and being a journalist, uh, became a career option and Will William Hazlitt was one of the people at the forefront of that. If you want to read more about William Hazlitt and he's really really a fascinating character then I would recommend Duncan Wu's book uh, William Hazlitt at the first modern man. It's really excellent and it gives a good background as to why uh, we can think of Hazlitt as ushering in a new kind of uh, new kind of writing. He was also, though, William Hazlitt was also a painter. Indeed, he trained uh, to be a painter before turning to the literary sphere. Uh, and indeed, the painting uh, on the front cover of Wu's book is Hazlitt's self-portrait from 1802. So William Hazlitt is an important, uh, as a romantic figure, not only in his own right, but as a great influence on the romantic poet John Keats. So, for example, on the 27th of January 1818, William Hazlitt gave a famous, uh, this is one of William Hazlitt's famous series of lectures, and this particular lecture on this evening was on Shakespeare and Milton. These are the lectures on the English poets that he gave at the Surrey Institution. And John Keats attended this lecture, and he attended um, some others of those lectures as well. Hazlitt would go on to publish these lectures uh, as lectures on the English poets uh, later that same year, so they were published uh, in 1818. And William Hazlitt declared of William Shakespeare's genius, why Shakespeare was such an amazing writer, this is what he said. The striking peculiarity of Shakespeare's mind was its generic quality, its power of communication with all other minds so that it contained a universe of thought and feeling within itself and had no one peculiar bias or exclusive excellence more than another. He was just like any other man, but that he was like all other men. He was the least of an egotist that it was possible to be. He was nothing in himself, but he was all that others were or what they could become. So this assessment of Shakespeare's genius was a key influence on John Keats's conception of the chameleon poet, which you may have heard of, and the ideal poetical character, which I will come back to at the end of the video today. But what I particularly want you to hold on to is William Hazlitt's conception of Shakespeare's genius, that he was the least of an egotist that it was possible to be. And that's going to be particularly relevant in the second half of the video today when I discuss Hazlitt's dislike of what he calls exclusionism in matters of literary appreciation. So the text that I'm going to be analysing today, titles, as I've said, On Envy, a dialogue, was written by William Hazlitt and it stages a, a dialogue, a conversation, between himself and his friend James Northcote. So in the 1770s, James Northcote had served a five-year apprenticeship 
under Sir Joshua Reynolds, one of the most well-known uh, painters of the 18th century. And in 1787, James Northcote had been elected as a member of the Royal Academy. So he's a really established artistic figure, a generation older than Hazlitt, who Hazlitt looked up to and had lots of conversations with about uh, all matters artistic. So in this essay, the two discuss artistic envy. So that's painterly and literary envy as well. And the manifestation of that artistic envy. They ask, what happens when one author feels envy for another? How does that, or does it, affect their own work? In this analysis, I'm going to focus on the envy that the Lake School of Romantic Writers, so the Lake School is William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge and Robert Southey. And at this time, Robert Southey was the Poet Laureate. He'd been um, made the Poet Laureate in 1813. So I'm going to focus on the envy that they have, the Lake School have, for Alexander Pope. Alexander Pope had been the preeminent poet of the neoclassical period, which was at the beginning of the first half of the 18th century, end of the 17th, beginning of the 18th century. In other words, Pope had been the most successful and popular poet of the previous literary generation. And rather like children <laughs> rebelling against their parents, one can think of romantic writers rebelling against the influence and hegemony of Alexander Pope's style of poetry. So, to get to the paper then. In the essay on envy, William Hazlitt states bluntly, I do not think there is any point of sympathy between Pope and the Lake School. On the contrary, I know there is an antipathy between them. So today I will outline two elements of Hazlitt's assessment of the Lake School's antipathy towards Alexander Pope. The first is the problem of imitation and the second, the egotism of exclusionism in taste. First, the problem of imitation. The problem for Pope's reputation in the Romantic period, according to William Hazlitt, was that he was too popular. His fame and other authors' envy of his abilities and achievements provoked pale imitations which in turn reflected poorly on the original. And Alexander Pope was far from alone in falling prey to overpopularity. Modern writers too, um, so William Hazlitt's Romantic Period contemporaries, suffered this fate. In The Spirit of the Age from 1825, which is another um, collection of essays by William Hazlitt, Hazlitt opens this, the essay in that volume on Sir Walter Scott. Walter Scott was the most popular and really by that I suppose I mean commercially successful novelist of the Romantic period and Lord Byron is the same kind of figure for poetry, the most popular, the most commercially successful poet of the Romantic period. Hazen opens the essay on Sir Walter Scott by asserting that Scott is undoubtedly the most popular writer of the age, yet Scott's legendary status had led others to imitate him. And in Hazlitt's contention, while Sir Walter may indeed surfeit us, his imitators make us sick. So the problem here is not Sir Walter Scott, the problem is that he has so many imitators that make Hazlitt and indeed other uh, contemporaries sick because there's just too, too much of it. So echoing what he had earlier said about Walter Scott in The Spirit of the Age, in the essay on Envy, published, as I've said, the next year in 1826, William Hazlitt's description of the damage, the mimicry of insipid imitators had done to Scott's reputation. It is not the excellence of that fine writer that we are tired of or revolt at, but vapid, imitations or catch-penny repetitions of himself. And this quotation serves well to explain Alexander Pope's fortunes at the hands of critics of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Alexander Pope himself does not tire or disgust, but endless, bland and mercenary repetitions and imitations of him do. The very prevalence of such derivative efforts, Hazlitt believes, has an obvious tendency 
to lessen instead of increasing our admiration. It seems to be an evidence, he writes, that there is no difficulty in the task of producing Popian poetry. This is to be regretted, since readers have not been used to look upon works of genius as of the fungus tribe. So people don't like to think of genius as being uh, being like a fungus, so that little mushrooms, you know, spread up kind of easily and everywhere. So readers have not been used to look upon works of genius as of the fungus tribe. It is difficult to lend credence to a superiority of genius when it works without consciousness or effort, executes the labour of a life in a few weeks, writes faster than the public can read, and scatters the rich materials of thought and feeling like so much chaff. So the problem is that it's so popular that it, get, it gets pick, Pope's poetry gets picked up by so many imitators that it makes it look easy. It makes it look too easy because they're lifting all the best bits of Pope and just scattering them around everywhere. And these imitations are being produced faster than the public can read. So it lessens Pope's genius because other people are sort of jumping on the back of it. Genius, thus conceived, is no longer special, rare or otherworldly. Instead, it is diluted, quotidian, even common. As Hazlitt's Northcote observes, so as I've said, On Envy is um, a dialogue staged between Hazlitt, so himself, he appears in his own dialogue, and the painter James Northcote. So Hazlitt's Northcote, in the essay, observes, Imitators do all the mischief and bring real genius into disrepute. Pope's reputation was clouded, Northcote argues in the essay, by a surfeit of imitations. And this is in some measure an excuse for those who have endeavoured to disparage Pope. He's talking about now in the Romantic period that because there are so many imitations, this is an excuse for the Romantic, for some of the contemporary Romantic writers to have disparaged Pope. Poetry in the hands of a set of mechanic scribblers, as Hazlitt's Northcote explains, had become such a tame, mawkish thing that we could endure it no longer, and our impatience of the abuse of a good thing transferred itself to the original source, that is, Alexander Pope himself. So the fury at the imitators has been transferred to Alexander Pope. It was, in effect, such a phenomenon of the transferal of indignation which enabled Wordsworth, this is a quote, which enabled Wordsworth and the rest to raise up a new school or to attempt it on the ruins of Pope. Because a race of writers had succeeded him without one particle of his wit, sense and delicacy. And the world were tired of this everlasting sing-song and namby-pamby. And Hazlitt there is using in the term namby-pamby a term that is itself a reference to Alexander Pope. So the term namby-pamby, uh, meaning weak and insipid and unsophisticated and childish, was the Scribblerous Club's nickname for the poet Ambrose Phillips. So the Scribblerous Club was the group of neoclassical writers, Alexander Pope, Jonathan Swift, John Gay, um, John Arbuthnot, uh, and so on. And what the Scribblerous Club would do is they'd get together and they'd condemn what they saw as the weak, insipid, unsophisticated, childish writings of their contemporaries. And you can see that in particularly in things like the Dunciad. So Namby Pamby was the Scribblerous Club's nickname for the poet Ambrose Phillips, who wrote things like um, the Pastorals, popular poets of, of the period. Um, and in the Dunciad Variorum from 1729, for instance, Alexander Pope had written that in Dunceland, Namby Pamby be preferred for wit. So Hazlitt is essentially drawing on that same idea to describe the contemporary literary scene in the period that he is writing in using that term Namby Pamby. Hazlitt's Northcote neatly summarises the perils imitation poses for a poet's legacy. I think a key part of understanding Alexander Pope's literary reputation in the Romantic period is to recognise how certain writers 
especially as Hazlitt observes the Lake School, reacted not so much against Pope himself, but rather against the nauseous, that's a quote, oversaturation of Popian poetry, caused by the race of writers who had succeeded and imitated him. So now I move on to the second half when I'm going to look at the egotism of exclusionism in taste. A particular pet peeve of William Hazlitt's was what he called exclusionism in taste. And here in this half, I want you to keep in mind William Hazlitt's assessment of Shakespeare's genius that I quoted earlier. He was the least of an egotist that it was possible to be. In 1826, in the essay on envy, William Hazlitt observed that a bigoted and exclusive spirit is real blindness to all excellence but our own, or that of some particular school or sect. This is with particular reference to the Lake School and their envy of Alexander Pope. For William Hazlitt, such envy was not unnatural or malicious, but begins only with the natural limits of their own tastes and feelings. Indeed, the Lake School's antipathy towards Pope says more about them than it does him. It is not that they are unwilling to allow merit, but that they are unable to perceive it. Hazlitt writes, Mr Wordsworth, Mr Coleridge and Mr Southey have no feeling for the excellence of Pope. They do not enter at all into his merits. They do not enter at all into. So to be, Hazlitt is saying, to be a good literary critic, you have to enter into his merits. So you have to enter into the merits of the person whose work you are looking at. They do not enter at all into his merits. And on that account, it is that they deny, proscribe and envy them. Pope's merits. Hazlitt observes that incredulous odi is the explanation here. Incredulous odi uh, meaning I disbelieve and therefore detest from Horace's Ars Poetica. I disbelieve and therefore detest. I don't understand and therefore I hate is another way of, um, of phrasing it. Hazlitt uses it with particular reference to William Wordsworth for whom he says gliding verse brilliant diction and the fine turn of thought in Pope have no charms. Wordsworth has no faculty in his mind to which these qualities of poetry address themselves. Accordingly, Hazlitt does not consider Wordsworth's apparent distaste for Pope to arise from an oppressive, galling sense of Pope's merits or a burning envy to rival them and shame that he cannot. And this is the criticism that Hazlitt's Northcote accuses them of. So Northcote says that it's this burning envy to rival Pope and shame that they can't reach Pope's perfection. That's what has created this hostility. And Hazlitt says, Hazlitt has a different idea. He well, in this staged version, Northcote's idea and Hazlitt's idea, but they are, of course, both Hazlitt's ideas. Hazlitt's idea is not that it comes from this burning, um, sort of aggressive envy, but from the incommensurability of, fundamentally, incommensurability of Wordsworth's understanding of poetry and that of Pope. Even if he could, Wordsworth would not write like Pope, Hazlitt argues, because he has no more ambition to write couplets like Pope than to turn a barrel organ. And here Hazlitt plays on Samuel Taylor Coleridge's condemnation in the Briographia Literaria from 1817 that modern poetry has been mechanised into a barrel organ. A barrel organ is one of those um, sort of instruments which has the holes cut out on little punch cards and the organ grinder turns, cranks the handle and the um, pattern on the little punch card means that the organ plays a tune. So it's a mechanised uh, 
uh, form of art, you could say. And Coleridge draws on that um, imagery to say that that is what modern poetry essentially has become, mechanised, that it's kind of prefabricated, that it's not truly artistic and that modern poet, poets are organ grinders rather than um, proper poets. This lack of sympathy with Alexander Pope's verse, this absence of ambition to emulate it, however, infects, William Hazlitt suggests, William Wordsworth's response to Pope in his literary criticism. So William Wordsworth can write whatever poetry he wants to, but uh, Hazlitt is suggesting that things ought to be a bit different when it comes to William Wordsworth's literary criticism of Alexander Pope. So Hazlitt writes, he, Wordsworth, has no pleasure in such poetry, Pope's poetry, and therefore he has no patience with others that have. The enthusiasm that they feel and express on the subject seems an effect without a cause and puzzles and provokes the mind accordingly. Mr Wordsworth in particular is narrower in his tastes than other people because he sees everything from a single and original point of view. Perhaps Understandably, the singularity and originality of Wordsworth's own poetic perspective limits and narrows his appreci appreciation for the poetry of others. Whatever does not fall in strictly with his understanding of good poetry, he accounts no better than a delusion or a play upon words. And the problem here, Hazlitt is suggesting, is that that William Wordsworth has no patience for others that do have pleasure in such poetry. And it's the lack of patience in other people who do appreciate Pope's poetry that is the problem. Samuel Johnson, in his Life of Pope from 1781, had declared, it is surely superfluous to answer the question that has once been asked, whether Pope was a poet, otherwise than by asking in return, if Pope be not a poet, where is poetry to be found? To circumscribe poetry by a definition will only show the narrowness of the definer, though a definition which shall exclude Pope will not easily be made. Hazlitt applies the same logic to literary commentators who are exclusionists in taste. That Wordsworth cannot appreciate Pope's poetry only shows the narrowness of Wordsworth. Hazlitt would go on to write unflinchingly in his article, The Exclusionists in Taste, which would be published again a few years later, this time in the Atlas on the 26th of July, 1829, that we hate comparisons or the exclusive in matters of taste and reject, abjure and renounce all decisions and systems of criticism founded upon them. All this is mere depreciation and petty spite. It is running the downhill path of egotism and conceit. Some people are willing to give up Pope as being no poet, Hazlitt continues, while others lord and celebrate him. And what does this prove? Hazlitt asks. Surely, not that there is some one thing in the world which we have found out to be good, and that mankind are fools for admiring anything else, but that there is an endless variety of excellence, nearly equal in different ways, if we had but the sense, and Hazlitt here is drawing on a very uh, Popean term there in, in, in using the word sense, if we had but the sense and spirit to enter properly into it. And here we've got the idea, entering properly into it. Hazlitt had used the same diction in On Envy to describe the exclusionism of Mr. Wordsworth, Mr. Coleridge and Mr. Southey, who do not enter at all into Pope's merits, which I described earlier. Hazlitt accuses the exclusionists in taste of acting on egotism, and conceit. The ideal literary critic should, conversely, be an in 
exclusionist in taste should enter properly into variety with sense and spirit should appreciate the excellences of a pope and a wordsworth so i mentioned at the beginning of this video the idea of the chameleon poet and the um, ideal poetical character as John Keats described it and that being influenced by William Hazlitt in his um, essay um, describing the genius of Shakespeare. I want to close by suggesting that John Keats's Hazlittian idea of the poetical character being oppositional to the words worthian and egotistical sublime aligns with Hazlitt's notion of the ideal critical character. In his famous letter to Richard Woodhouse on the 27th of October 1818, so you'll notice this is the same year as the lectures on the English poets uh, when um, he went to the lecture by Hazlitt on Shakespeare, Keats wrote of the poetical character, it is not itself, it has no self, it is everything and nothing, it has no character, it enjoys light and shade, it lives in gusto, be it foul or fair, high or low, rich or poor, mean or elevated. It has as much delight in conceiving an Iago as an Imogen. These are Shakespeare's characters. So he's referring again to Hazlitt's idea of Shakespearean genius being that he is not an egotist. He removes himself, his own sense of self from his work so that the characters speak for themselves. What shocks the virtuous philosopher delights the chameleon poet. And that's the idea of the chameleon poet, that it, beca that it filters into other bodies and it takes on the characteristics of all those other bodies and the egotism of the poet is removed. It is not itself, it has no self. It is everything and nothing. I would suggest that John Keats's non-egotistical chameleon poet is rather like William Hazlitt's inclusionist chameleon critic. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Remember, if you like what I do here on my channel where I analyse classic literature, then do subscribe. And if you have liked the video, then do press the thumbs up button. It does help me out in YouTube's algorithm. And I'd love to know your response to William Hazlitt's essay on envy. Do you agree with William Hazlitt that Alexander Pope's literary reputation suffered from the effects of envy from bad imitators and exclusionist romantic critics? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below.